Um, hey, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Before I do, I just want to pray, Lord. We just, God, I thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that your word is powerful. Lord, it's living and active. And Father, we, I pray this morning, Lord, just as we open up your word and we have a look at it, God, would you speak to our hearts? Would you challenge us, Lord? Not just those of us in the room, but God, people at home watching. Lord, would you challenge us with the reality of your word? And Father, would you expose and open up the things in our hearts, Lord? Would you draw us closer to yourself, Lord, and continue that journey of conforming us more and more into the image of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to ask you a question. What did General Peter Cosgrove, Axel Rose, Dave Grohl, Billy Graham, Jimmy Barnes, Jim Baker, Richard Branson, Wayne Pierce, and Catherine Coleman all have in common. Some of them had money. You're all failing miserably, so I'm just going to move on. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it later on. For the meantime, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Verse 12 and 14. We're going to continue talking out of this uh, passage. We began it last week. We're going to continue this week. We'll probably continue uh, next week as well. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Paul writing this, he says, Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not count myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Last week we started looking at this one thing. Paul, with all the revelation he had and the experiences he had and all the stuff that he knew uh, about God, he, he kind of goes, look, of all those things, I just want to tell you unequivocally, there's one thing I've learned. In all my years of walking with the Lord, there's one thing I can confidently say to you unequivocally that I've learned. There's lots of things I've learned, but there's one thing I'm so confident in that I'm going to share this one thing with you. And he goes on and he says that the one thing is forgetting what's behind and straining what's ahead and pressing on toward the goal and the prize. But the first thing there is he says that I've got to let go of what's behind. I've got to forget what's behind. And we talked a little bit about what that kind of looks like last week, what he meant by that. He didn't mean forget what's behind us and erase it from your memory. Because we all have things behind us that we can't erase from our memory. Experiences we've had, things that have happened to us. And the Bible is not encouraging. Paul's not saying to them, I want you to somehow get to this utopic state where you erase all that stuff from your memory. What he's getting at is he's going, I don't want you to focus on that stuff. Because if we're straining and pressing ahead, he's using this analogy of a runner. And if I'm running in a race, the minute I go past that space, I've got to let go of that place on the track. I've got to keep looking ahead and I've got to keep running ahead. That place is a part of my experience. It's a part of my journey. It's where I've been. But if I stop and turn around and look back at it, if I'm focused on that, I'm not straining ahead and not running towards the prize. And I'm certainly not going to win the race. I'm going to stumble, I'm going to lose momentum, I'm in danger of losing my way. And this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, one thing I've learned is that I'm going after this prize, this goal, but the first thing I've got to do is forget what's behind. And we talked about that last week. And the second thing he says is, once you forget what's behind, he says, you've got to strain forward for what's up there. You've got to strain for what's up ahead. And the, the Greek word there has the image of an athlete running and hand outstretched to grab the prize and the veins are popping out and bulging in there. That's literally the picture that Greek word uh, paints is of that person straining with every muscle, every fibre, every part of their being. Not just kind of, I'll give it 80%. No, no, this is someone giving 110% to reach that prize, to reach that goal. That's what he's saying, that, that we've got to be like that. We've got to strain with every ounce of our being to get to that goal. Next week, I'm hoping to look a little bit about what does it mean for straining and striving? How do we strain and strive? But before we talk about straining and striving for the goal, I think it's really important we know what the goal is that we're straining and striving for. So I want to look today at what is the goal that Paul's talking about here. Paul's he's talking about something, isn't he? We know he's talking about something. He goes on and he says that I'm reaching for something. He says I haven't attained it yet. 
Well, you only know you haven't attained something if you know what that something is. Otherwise, how do you know whether you have it or not? Well, you know you don't have it because you know what it is and it's not there. He says, I'm pressing on for something that I haven't got yet. There's something up ahead. So Paul had this goal in mind when he's speaking this to the Philippians. And Paul knew what the goal was, and it was something concrete. It was something solid. What's, what's the goal that Paul's talking about? He says in verse 12, he says, I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. And then in verse 13, he says, I'm straining forward for what lies ahead. Then again in verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal. There's this, this reaching and heading for something. But what's he moving ahead for? What's, what's so important up there that he's going to let go of the past and he's going to strain to go ahead? What's so important? What is the goal that Paul's heading towards? So before we look at the process of moving ahead, we're going to have a quick look at what's Paul encouraging us to move ahead to. What's he encouraging us to move ahead to? What was the goal that Paul was saying, forget what's behind and strain ahead for? If you go back a few verses to Philippians 3, verse 7 to 10, Paul gives us a picture and tells us this is what the goal is. This is what the goal is. And I want to encourage you this morning, I don't know what you think the purpose or the goal of the Christian life is. I don't know what you think it is. But I know the various and many different things I've been told it is throughout my time of walking with God and going to conferences and, and, and going to seminars and reading books. and pod- I know what I've been told the goal is. It can get confusing. It can get really confusing. But, but Paul makes it very, very uh, simple and plain here what the goal is for the Christian life. And if we know what the goal is, then we'll know why we're letting go of all the things and forgetting what's in the past. And we'll know why it's worth straining and striving for. And so what's the goal Paul's talking about? Philippians 3, verse 7 to 10. He says this, whatever were gains to me, he's just rattled off this resume of how great he was in terms of, if it was all about law, this is, I've made it. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I'm so zealous, I'm killing uh, Jesus' people, I've, I've, I've trained up by the best, I know it all, I've, I'm meticulous in my, in my following of all the dots and tittles. Like... But he goes, you know what? Whatever was gained to me now, I now consider it loss for what? The sake of Christ. Say, everyone say it. The sake of who? The sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss because of, and what does he say? The surpassing worth of what? Of knowing who? Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm laying it all down for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may what? Gain Christ. All that stuff's rubbish and garbage. I'll lay it all down. I'll give it all up on the best of days for the sake of having Christ. For the sake of having Christ. And be found in him, I love this bit, not having a righteousness on my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, that's why we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Because we have a righteousness upon us that's been given to us from God because we put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. It's not ourselves. None of us, none of us are that good. Hand up if you think you're that good. I'm glad you didn't put your hand up. It was a bit of a trap. It's amazing how many people don't listen to go, all I heard was hand up, yeah? You're listening. Well done. It says, be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And, and, and this here is the goal. This is the goal that Paul's talking about right here, wrapped up in these next five words. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. What's this goal that Paul's given everything up for? What's this goal that he's forgetting what's behind for? What's this goal that he's straining forward to know? He says, I want to know Christ. Think about that. I want to know Jesus, the anointed one of God, the Messiah. I want to know him. And getting to know him and having a relationship with him and growing my relationship, it's, it's worth way more than anything else on this planet that could come your way. To the point where I would give it all up just to get to know him. Just to get to know Christ, to know Jesus. And then he goes on and he kind of 
expands it a little bit on, okay, what practically kind of, what does that mean? Like to know Christ, it's kind of an abstract sort of thought. So what, what do you mean know Christ? And he goes on and he kind of explains, well, here's some of the ways that I get to know Christ. He says, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. In other words, the transforming power of the resurrected Jesus in his life. The power that raised Jesus from the dead that can come into your life and mine and can raise our life from spiritual death. From, from the death of hopelessness, from the death of despair, from the death of no purpose, from the death of depression, from the death of not wanting to get out of bed in the morning, from the death of having no direction. He says, I want that power that raised Jesus, that resurrection power. He says, I want that in my, I want my life resurrected, my hopes resurrected, dreams resurrected. That, I want that. I want to experience that in my life. I want to experience that power that raised him from the dead. That, that, that literally brought him to life physically and that one day will keep us alive physically. We'll, we, we, we'll move on out of this body, but we will live forever because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. But Paul says, I want to experience it this side. I'm not just waiting until I get there. I want to experience the power, the transforming power of Jesus in my life that breaks addictions, that, that opens prison doors, the power of God that can set people free. The power of God that can, 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 can remove sickness from a human body. And God can do that stuff. Why doesn't he always? I don't get it all, but I know he can. The, the, the power of God that can, can, can take a person from down here up to here. He says, I want to experience the power of that resurrection in my life right now. And then he says, and, and particip- the participation in his sufferings. How many of you know that part of the Christian life is suffering? Now, I know that we live in a world that says, no, you can come to Jesus and all your sufferings are gone. It's just not true. You don't get that testimony by watching these people try telling it to those 12 disciples, suffering's over when you came to Christ as their head's coming off, as they're getting beaten and stoned. Suffering's a part of it. Every time we make a choice to obey God, guess what? How many of you know there's sometimes an element of suffering, isn't there? If you've had to make the choice, you've probably experienced a bit of suffering. Because there are some things where we don't even make the choice. We just flow with it and it's just God's transformed and changes and we just, we're just that way now. I don't even have to make the choice anymore because it's just part of me. Maybe some of you, you know, you, you had every second word was a foul word that came out of your mouth and then you come to Christ and you, 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 your mouth has been redeemed and, you know, now all that foul language you used to use, it, you don't even think about it. You, have a, you say a sentence, you're not thinking hard of it, all better not say that. But before that, you probably came to a church and you said, yeah, I watched a... Footy on the weekend. And you're trying hard and you're trying to, straining and, and not saying, now you don't have to. because you. But there are other areas of your world where maybe you still want to do things that you know aren't necessarily in line with the best that God has for you. And so you make these choices to not, and there's that inner turmoil, that spirit and flesh conflicting, and there's that little bit of suffering. There's making that decision and, and maybe getting ridiculed because you made that choice instead of that choice, and so you're a Jesus freak. And so there's that little bit of suffering. And there are elements of suffering that come with the Christian life. It's just a fact. Jesus tried to tell us that thousands of years ago. If they reject me, they'll reject you. If they treat me like this, they'll treat you like that. He he told us this, but yet we still feel like we can create a utopic Christian world where we don't, but we do. And Paul says that's part of getting to know God. It's part of getting to know Jesus. And then he says, becoming like him in his death. In other words, eventually getting to that place where we're like Jesus. Anyone remember the scene in the Garden of Eden? Jesus is there. He's in the Garden of Eden. He's kneeling. He's sweating drops of blood. And he's having this conversation with his father. And he's saying, I sure could do with a way out here, Lord. Dad, I would love another option. But at the end of that wrestle, he finishes by saying, but you know what? It's not about me. It's about you. Not my will be done, but yours be done. This is what Paul's saying. I want to be conformed to him in his death. See, Jesus died physically on the cross, didn't he? But he died before that. He died in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a picture of us. We die to ourselves. You can die to yourself while you're alive. And we see people do it. Martyrs didn't die when they were physically murdered. Martyrs died long before that when they made the decision that I've left everything behind. I'm straining forward. All I care about is knowing Christ. That's number one. It's that decision that we make. Now, to know something in English, it means to be aware of information about something. That's what English, the word, English word know means to be aware of information about. So, so I might know uh, physics. 
which I don't, by the way. I absolutely failed anything to do with science at school. But knowledge in English, when we talk about knowing something, we just talk about being aware of information or facts about something. But the Greek word for know that's used here, know, is a, is a different word. The Greek concept of knowledge was not just intellectual but experiential. So when the, Greeks even, when the Greeks talk about knowledge, they talk about not just something that you can know in your head, but they talk about something that's also experiential in life. It's the Greek word gnosko, and it means not just intellect, but it means uh, experiential as well, knowing something through observation and experience. Uh, in Matthew one twenty five, the, the, the words used to describe uh, 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 Joseph, and, and Mary, and you know, uh, uh, Mary, the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and Jesus' birth, and Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph is an amazing man. We don't know a lot about him. I'd love to sit down with Joseph one day when I get there, and I want to say, Joseph, you're just an amazing man. I mean, he hears that, that he, the one he's betrothed to is pregnant outside of marriage. In that culture, that's just not good. And what does he do? It says that he wanted to keep it quiet and protect her image, so he just, on the quiet, decided to, I mean, I'm just thinking, man, that's amazing. That's amazing. He wanted to kind of protect her image and so on. And then, of course, he has this dream and realizes, wow, this is of God. But it says after he worked that out, and, and, he, he, and she's already pregnant, and, and it says in, in, in Matthew one twenty five, it says, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. The New King James, I think, says, and he never knew her. In other words, they never came together. That word consummate knew, it's the same word, gnosko. It's, it's talking about they never had this, this intimate experience of one another until Jesus was born. So the Greek word, uh, when you read know in the Greek, it, it's, it's not just I know facts and information about, it's knowledge with experience. Uh, Joseph never experienced intimacy like that with Mary. And Paul's going... I want to experience that intimacy, not just know about, but I want to experience that intimacy with Christ. Paul says this is the goal of the Christian life, people. The goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus. The goal of the Christian life, the prize that we're straining for, should be to know Jesus, to get to know God, to know about, but also to experience God. I mean, who wants a Christianity where you come to church every Sunday and all we're trying to do is it's like an exam. It's just here's some verses. Go away and memorize them. There'll be a test at the end of the day. And if you pass the test because you memorize... I'm not turning up every week just because I want to hear information about somebody. I can stay at home and read information about somebody. I don't want to give my life to a piece of information. I didn't give up all I gave up when I came to Christ, which really wasn't a lot, to be honest. But still, I gave up the freedom of being popular and and pursuing all these things and having all these friends. Yeah, exactly. And now, you know, of being encouraged, encouraged to do the lifestyle I was doing. And boy, didn't I get some encouragement in my old lifestyle. And then I got saved and became a pastor. And every now and then someone says, well done. But I didn't give that up. I'm not giving up my old life because of a, so I can get to know some information. The disciples didn't give up their life so they could get some information. They gave up their life because they knew God. They experienced Christ. When the times of fulfillment came, God did not go, the Ten Commandments aren't working anymore. Let's send them down a book. We'll give them the leather book. And down it came. And Mary woke up one morning and under her pillow there lies the leather bound book. And so Mary took thy leather-bound book and memorized and told everybody, you need a leather-bound book. Get to know it. I'm not mocking the Bible. I'm not reading it. What I'm saying is it's not just about knowing stuff. It's about experiencing God. When Jesus came to earth, what did he do? He said to these bunch of followers, these people, he said, follow me. In other words, come, hear what I'm saying, and see what I'm doing. Experience me. Experience me. And the goal of our Christian life should be number one to get to know Christ, to get to know Jesus, to get to know who God is. Now, when I talk about experience, I'm not talking about weird, you know, who's ever seen weird and wacky and wonderful experiences out there? Anyone ever had any encounters of weird and wacky experiences? I've had friends of mine that jumped in and out of rings of power in public places and uh, it was just. You know, when I stepped in here, I just laughed and fell on the ground. I'm thinking, yeah, and all the school kids around you and the buses think you're a loony dude. 
And then when I jumped out, I stopped laughing and I was sad. And I jumped in, I was amazing, it was God. I'm thinking, no, it wasn't probably God. It's just weird. Just weird. I've had friends who've had visitations of the Apostle Paul. He stood before them, given the prophetic words that walked all around town and given prophetic words to all the pastors in that town. And the fruit of it in the end was they ended up in the loony bin in a straitjacket, lost their wife and their kids. I'm not talking about those really weird experiences. And when I first got saved, by the way, I read a book which I shall not name. But I read a book by a, a, a guy and he talked about how every day after school he'd come home and the Holy Spirit would come into his bedroom with him and would speak to him and teach him and so on. And I thought, that's amazing. So what do you think I did? I've just come to know Jesus and I want to get to know him better. Mate, I would spend all, I'd come home and I'd go in the room and I'd sit there and I'd just sit there quietly and I'd be going, right, yeah, God, you did it for him. And so speak to me, speak to me. And I sat there week after week after week and nothing happened. And I almost wanted to throw this Christian thing away because I thought, but God, he said, that's how it works. No, no, not all experiences. I'm not talking weird experiences. But what I'm talking about is the reality, the evidential reality of the presence of God in your life. And I'm not anti-experiences. I'm I'm sure people have experienced encounters with God. I've had a few myself. But Paul's saying here that I want to understand and experience Christ. That's what I want. And that's the goal. The goal is to know... (laughs) through intellect and experience, Jesus. That's, Jesus is the destination. Jesus is the destination. Let, 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 me, let me put it this way. It's not becoming a preacher, a missionary, a worship leader, a pastor, or a prophet to the nations. That's not the goal. Yet for how many people is that the goal? We're just waiting and sitting in the wings, waiting, just waiting till somebody recognizes how, how brilliant I am. When they recognize how brilliant I am, God, it's going to begin then. That's not the goal. Get to know Jesus where you are. That's the goal. You'll find more satisfaction in getting to know Jesus than you ever will in becoming one of those things. If if that's the goal, guess what? You get there and you'll be as empty as the drug addict who thought that 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 was the goal, that that would help. Now, these things can leave you as empty as anything else if you think they're the goal. They're not the goal. It's not speaking at a conference. It's not writing the next big Christian book. It's not having a successful podcast playing in a traveling worship band. It's not finding your spiritual gifts. How many Christians, their Christian life revolves around the pursuit of spiritual gifts. Hey, I'm all for spiritual gifts. I believe in spiritual gifts, but they're not the goal. We're not chasing spiritual gifts. We should desire them. Paul says, desire them. He says, eagerly desire them, actually. But he says the goal is knowing Christ. That's 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 what matters. That's what matters. We, we chase after Christ. We want to know God. We want relationship with Jesus. That's the most important thing. It's not discovering your destiny or your calling. How many people are frustrated to the eyeballs because you're sitting in a job or a place or somewhere going, oh, this is not my destiny, not my future, and you're frustrated. And it's, Hey, you know what? Get to know Jesus. That's the goal. The, the, the goal is not to find your destiny and your call. Hey, it's a good to find. Look, no dramas. I'm not saying it's bad, but what I'm saying is don't make it the goal of your life. You'll forever be disappointed. Because you know what? You might get to what you think is your destiny and your goal, but when you get there, if you're still focused on that, you'll be empty. Because it's not about that. It's not about that. Paul said the goal was to continue to grow in our knowledge and experience of God. And everything else flows out of that. Everything else comes out of that. All of those things, the gifts, the calling, the, all that, they're all byproducts of getting to know God. They're byproducts of a person who gets to know God. Some people turn the goal into the pursuit of gifts and call, and they usually end up in trouble, don't they? If that's the pursuit, if that's what you're chasing, I've just listened to a podcast recently about a guy and he grew a church to a massive big church and, 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 and took 10 years, whatever, to build this church into the tens of thousands international, traveling around, speaking, most popular guy on the circuit. And the whole thing died in two weeks. And in the end, looking back at it, it really was just all about him. It was all about a platform. It was all about, look at me, here I am, I'll change the world for Jesus. It's all me. Wanted wanted big ministry, big church, but lost the goal. I don't care what you are, chase Jesus. The goal is Jesus, it's to know Jesus. That's the goal. There are other people who lose their focus on the way and they stop pursuing relationship with God and start focusing more on the gifts and their call. 
and they end up losing their way. And the church space is littered with people like that. And I'm not just talking about people in ministry and public you might have heard of. There'll be people that have sat in pews that have done the same thing. You probably know people who've done the same thing. They've lost their way. They've got burnt. They blame this, blame that, blame this. Let me tell you something. If it all collapses, but I'm, my goal is Jesus, well, Jesus doesn't collapse. I can still go on. I'm not going to spend my whole life going, oh, I passed at a church once, it didn't work out. Oh, I did. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm chasing Jesus. And everything else that comes out is a byproduct of that. It's a byproduct of that. And we live in a Western church world where there are just so many things out there and so many angles and slants we come from. And I think we just got to get back to the simplicity of what this whole journey is about. We were separated from God at one point in time because of our sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross, removed that barrier of sin so we can come back into a relationship with God. It's beautiful and it's simple. And that's what Paul's saying. That's the goal, people. The goal is to pursue that relationship with God. And whatever God wants can flow out of that. Let it flow out of that. Because when chasing God becomes your first primary thing, when knowing Christ is your goal, I'll tell you what, that's that slipstream where where God just gets you in the right places at the right time. When we're chasing that. Get to know God. Make that the goal. Get to know God. We can see in a few pages in the New Testament just a couple of things I want to throw out this morning. The priority of knowing God and the impact it can have in your life if you make this your goal. 1 John 2, 3. John writes this, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. We know we've come to know him if we keep his commands. In other words, keeping the commands of God is a byproduct of knowing God. How many of you are trying so hard, you're making the focus of your Christian life trying to keep God's commands? Trying to dot every I, cross every T, trying to obey and be a good person. That's your goal. Hey, nothing wrong with that. We all want to be conformed to change. We all want to make better choices, better decisions. But here's the thing. If you're doing that and making that your goal, you're probably doing that in your own strength and your own power, and you're probably failing. And then you're probably guilting and condemning yourself, and you're probably on this ugly, vicious religious cycle where you never feel good about yourself, your faith, and you don't think God likes you. But obeying God, having the ability and capacity to do that, it flows out of knowing God. So stop trying to be good and get to know God. Get to know God and see what happens. See how your life is transformed. 1 John 4, 8, he goes on further. He said, whoever does not love does not know God. Because God's love. Who wants to be more loving? I do. Who wants to, 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 to have the kind of love that God wants us to have for one another and for the world out there and for him? I want to be that person that has that kind of love. Well, he's saying, if you don't know God, you're not going to have that love. In other words, genuine love, the way God desires us to have it, is a byproduct of what? Knowing God. Understanding and experiencing God. Love comes out when we make the goal knowing God. In John 16, verse 2 to 3, Jesus, uh, uh, speaking to his followers, he says this. He says, there's going to come a point. He says, they'll put you out of the synagogues. These are religious people. He said, these religious people are the ones that will put you out of the synagogues. He said, they'll put you out of the synagogues. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. You you can become really, really religious and not know God. You can You can memorize this book back to front. There are university lecturers at Stanford and Yale and Harvard, university lecturers who lecture on New Testament, Old Testament, and they don't know God. But they'll tell you everything that's written in that book, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. When Jesus was born, was Herod, what did he do? He called the religious leaders, said, this guy's been born, I've heard enough, where is he going to be born? And the Pharisees without batting an eyelid. He said, according to the scriptures, and they pulled out some ancient minor prophets and said, he's going to be born here, this, blah, 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 blah. They just, they just knew. Some of the Pharisees in Jesus' time had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. Who struggles to remember a verse? Yeah. Mate, they, these suckers had five books committed to memory. They knew their stuff, but they didn't know God. They knew a lot of stuff about him, but they didn't know God. In other words, giving up wrong behavior, a changed life is the byproduct of knowing God. Don't put all your energy into that. Put your energy into getting to know God because that's how we change. That's got to be the goal. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. I love this one. And I was thinking of you, I knew this morning when, I, when you got up. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. These men knew Jesus. 
They looked at him and said, you shouldn't be saying what you're saying, doing what you're doing, having the influence you're having. And we can't put it down to anything other than you guys have been with Jesus. You know Jesus. It's, it's interesting in the Greek, those, that word uh, unschooled and ordinary men, it's two Greek words, uh, uh, agramatos idiotos. It's where we get our modern word idiot from. Literally, they're saying these guys are unlettered or unlearned idiots. That's a literal translation. They looked and said they're unlearned, unlettered idiots, but hang on, they've just healed a person and people are getting excited about God. All we know is they know God. They know Jesus. These guys knew Jesus. In other words, courage to stand for and declare Jesus is a byproduct of knowing God. Knowing God. We see here that knowing God has a transformative effect on the one who knows him. It doesn't make us perfect, and it doesn't make us impervious to temptation. But it does mean that the power and the prompting to do right becomes evidentially present in our experience. In our experience. To know God is to allow the influence of God to penetrate and shape your life. Because God has influence on us. When we get to know God, he begins to influence us. New Testament Christianity is not about sin management, people. It's about knowing God. It's not about sin. I remember when I, I had this, this uh, moment where I, I gave my life to Jesus because my cousin did. I was at a, a, a thing at, at Austinville when we would have been 16 or 17 or something. My cousin, uh, I don't know how he ended up there and some, I don't even know who was preaching, who was doing what. But this guy up the front gives an altar call and says, come to forward if you need to know Jesus. My cousin, we were best mates. We lived together. I lived with him and his family. He grabs me on the arm and he goes, if I'm going, you're going. He dragged me up the front. So I'm standing up there with all these other kids and looking around going, I don't even know what I'm here for. You know? Anyway, the guy says, pray this prayer. And they all prayed. My cousin, he was, he was just on fire for Jesus for a total of about six weeks. And it all died out. But I remember after we prayed, we were taken into a room and this guy then begins to go, okay, now you've come to Jesus, here's what you've got to do. And there you go, sin management. Stop doing all this. Stop doing this. You can't be bad. You can't. I wish back then he had said, here's, here's the word of God. Now get to know him. Start getting to know him. Start getting to know him. Through, through the pages of these ancient documents, I'm not there with the disciples walking around, so I didn't hear everything verbally, and I didn't see everything optically. But I, I, I can, through the pages of this, hear the teachings of Jesus, and I get to see some of the experiences and what Jesus did through the pages of these ancient documents. I wish that he had have said to me then, hey, now here's this, now, now go and get to know him, because he wants relationship with you. Not just some robotic, obedient thing. He wants a relationship with you. Get to know him. You see, the cross dealt with sin's power to separate us from God. And now the Holy Spirit works within us to separate us from the power of sin. That's what he does. I remember years ago, we ran a connect group in another church we were a part of, and we were running this connect group. And uh, this, this guy, he, he got gloriously saved. We, he was baptized down at Shores Bay, and here we are right there uh, on the sand, pulled him out of the water, prayed for him, and he starts, those of you that believe in this stuff anyway, started manifesting demons right there, and all the crowd are walking around looking, what the heck's going on to this guy down here on the ground? And it was just the most amazing public display of, of, of God. And at the end of it, he just broke down weeping his wife came over his kids they were hugging it was one of the most beautiful moments i still remember to this day anyway not long after that um they started coming to our connect group we had this connect group we were running and i remember he walks into our connect group one day and everybody's there we had all these young uh families and couples we probably had about 20 was too, the connect group was too big but all these, these these people and most of them had been brought up in the church anyway this guy walks in first sunday he had a knock at the door we say come on in here his boots as he walks up the stairs, walks in with a six-pack of VB. <laughs> goes to the fridge, puts it in, pulls one out, cracks the top off, plops himself right in the middle of the rest of them and sits in and goes, okay, what are we talking about? <laughs> and I could see everybody going, oh, we're all going to hell. <laughs> Get behind me. Anyway, we realised, you know, okay, we've got to be a bit sensitive here. So when Connect Group finished and everybody left, we sat down, me and Zach, said, okay, what do we do? We don't want to go up to him. And so we've got to now... But I don't want him to think this is a sin management thing and God doesn't accept you as you are. Right? But at the same time, we also understand it's probably not the best environment. You know, there's other people here that have problems with it, so you know, prefer them and so on. So anyway, so what we did is we prayed. We just prayed. We said, Lord, we, we, we know that there needs to be an outcome here. God, would you do something? The following Tuesday, um, just before Connect, 
I get a phone call and he says, oh, can I catch up with you? I said, yep. I said, where are you? He said, I'm parked out the front of your house. So, okay, no worries. I went down, sat in his car with him and he goes, you know, I've been thinking. He said, I'm thinking I might make Tuesday a dry day. What do you reckon? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, look, mate, if, if that's what you're kind of feeling from God, because you're in a relationship with God now, and if you're feeling that prompting on the inside, that could be the Holy Spirit, then I would always encourage you to obey the Holy Spirit. And he looked at me and he went, yeah, I think I will. From now on, Tuesday's a dry day. So he started rocking up to connect without his six-pack of VB. We didn't have to manage his sin, trusted God. But the point is that this journey we're on, Christianity is not about sin management. It's not the goal. None of us are going to be perfect when we get to heaven. Who believes that? We're all going to have stuff. And sometimes we feel better than the person next to us because, well, I don't think your stuff's that bad. Or, or sorry, I think your stuff's really bad, but my stuff's okay. Well, I'm a hypocrite. Stuff's stuff. James said, you're guilty of breaking one law, you've broken them all. You've broken them all. Don't sit there judging other people going, I'm better than... No, no, no. You, you, you're not managing your sin, but I'm managing mine really well. You proud person. Manage your pride. Get a bit of humility about you. You see? But it's not about sin management. God deals with sin, and yes, we wanna, we, 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 we're, we're trying to, to run a good race, and we're going to get to something. But, but the, the core of it, our faith is about knowing God, and if we get to know God, it's amazing what can happen. Now, what a general Peter Cosgrove. Axel Rose, Dave Grohl, Billy Graham, Jimmy Barnes, Jim Baker, Richard Branson, Wayne Pierce, and Catherine Kuhlman all have in common? I've got their biographies at home <laughs> on my bookshelf. I've read their biographies, and in some cases, more than one. And I know all about them, but I don't know them. They're a part of the information I've accumulated throughout my 50 years of life, but they're not a part of my day-to-day -day experience. I've read about them, but I'm not basing my life around how they lived. I've read about them, but I'm not making my decisions on the basis of what I think might be pleasing to any of them. I've read about them, but I'm not wanting to be conformed into their images. They can inspire me. They can encourage me. I can take lessons out of their successes and lessons out of their failures, but their lives or deaths have given me no more power to transform than a ping pong ball has. But Jesus. How many of us put the, bi put the Bible on the biography shelf? We read it just to know about God. Instead of to actually know through understanding and then experience God. Can I encourage you this morning? I don't know where your heart is at. I don't know what your faith is based on. But I know a lot of us in Christianity get frustrated because we are chasing after the wrong goal. Can I encourage you this morning with the words of Paul? The goal is I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings so I can be conformed into the likeness of his death. Get to know Jesus. Chase after Jesus. Put Put knowing Jesus first. And we can know him, I would encourage you primarily, start by getting into his word. It's amazing how many Christians still won't pick up a Bible and read it unless they come to church Sunday and somebody else reads it to them. Get to know Jesus. And I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you all the other things will become byproducts of having a relationship with Jesus. Amen. Lord, I pray for each of us in this room this morning, God. You, you know our hearts and you know where we are at. And God, none of us are perfect. And, and Lord, none of us are going to be perfect when we get there at the end. So why, why make the goal the wrong thing? Why chase after things that won't deliver? Lord, I, I want to I go after the battery pack. Lord, I want to go after you, God. I want to know Jesus. And, I, and God, I know that, that, that as we get closer to you and the more we understand you and the more we experience your power in our life, all these other things become byproducts. They fall into place, Lord. So God, for each person here, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, help us to examine our own hearts and to know, Lord, have we, have we put you on the biography section? Are we happy just to know about you? Or do we have a passion to actually know you this morning and to be transformed by you and to experience you as you transform our life, God? I just pray that for each person in this room. Lord, and as we leave this place today, in the next seven days, Father, would you give each of us an opportunity to tell somebody outside the walls of this building, there are people out there that need to hear with, 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 with boldness, they need to hear with passion the, the message of the cross, they need to hear about Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Lord, would you give us the opportunity to tell some of these people about the goodness of God. Give us the boldness and the courage, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you guys.